two, one. So Elaine Goldsmith-Thomas, producer of Marry Me, thank you, thank you, thank you for making this movie, for bringing it to us now. Timing just is perfect. And, but we wanna know a bit about the genesis of Marry Me. How did this project come together? Well, it's interesting. The genesis goes back about nine years. I um, am partnered with Jennifer Lopez and I got a pitch for a television series based on a graphic novel called Marry Me. And it was broad and, um, um, uh, you know, kind of generic. I mean, it was a really good graphic novel, but, you know, and the writer said, I really want to do this as a series. I said, you know, I, I and I had, I've had a, a lot, a few jobs. You know, I used to be an agent in the 90s and I represented um, Jennifer. I represented Julia Roberts, um, Madonna, Susan Sarandon. And I sort of grew up on these, romantic comedies. And I felt that the DNA of this would really lend itself to not only a movie about, that harkens back to Roman holiday, but a movie about love and about a leap of faith and about trusting a romance of a universe. You know, we think we're all driving, right? And then something like COVID happens and it sort of reminds us we're not. And there was something poetic about the unlikely pairing of a superstar and an everyman, and something also very hopeful. So um, the writer was not interested uh, in writing a film, but I went to Jennifer's house. I was staying with her because I was based in New York. And I said, I, I had this interesting pitch and they wanna do it as a TV series. And I told her about the guy in the audience holding up the sign that says, marry me. And she said, you know how it should end. And then she, she dictated what the end should be. That's how we got that ending, was from Jennifer Lopez. I don't wanna ruin the ending, but it was her idea. The sign and the again, and that was all her. And she said, convince them. So, you know, that's like, you know, a red blanket with a bull. I went, okay. <laughs> And it took me a couple of months to convince the writer that we needed to do this as a film. And, um, and he was lovely and um, I write and he, he, he asked me to help him. And so we crafted a pitch, we pitched it around Hollywood and Universal bought it. And we developed a few drafts of it, um, always trying to find the reality in the, in the story, trying to find the reality in the preposterousness of the fact that this big superstar is marrying a fan and, and, and leaning into the humanity of the characters. And we, we really needed a filmmaker. And around that time, I had just seen Kat Coiro's work and began chasing her because I thought she would be uniquely, uniquely suited to it. And she jumped on board and helped us hone the, the first of all, the character of Charlie Gilbert, um, leaning into his humanity and, and really working with Jennifer to find the hu humanity in the superstar. And you know that somebody who could be a, surrounded by so many people could be so lonely. And um, we developed it for a little while longer and felt like we were ready to make it and Universal wasn't. So they put it in turnaround. So we went all over town again and um, STX, a company I was working with at the time on Hustlers, a movie I was producing, um, saw it and they went, wow, we love this. This could be a big event. And we said, great, will you take it? So they took it, we made Hustlers. And after Hustlers, before Hustlers came out, actually, they said, you know, romantic comedies don't do well overseas. And I said, they said, let's wait until 2020 to do it. And something inside all of us said, we've waited long enough. So they gave us a window. We went around town and Universal, oddly, was the one that said, we miss this project. We believe in it. But it was never easy to make it. They gave us $23 million. We had to, um, they, they allowed us to go to brands. Uh, so we went to Vitamix and we went to Guess and we went to Coach and we went to Hey Google and we went to Lexus. And in doing that, we were able to deepen Kat's character that she really was a walking brand.
and we were able to um, sort of infuse Owen's character, Charlie Gilbert. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt a, a superstar while they're juicing. So we leaned into um, the differences between them, and we um, got the brands to 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 agree to give us money up front. And in that way, I think we got an extra $3 million for the movie so we could make some of those big scenes. We started shooting it. We got greenlit in July of 2019. Jennifer was, had finished Hustlers. She was on tour with It's My Party Tour. She was in Europe. I, I FaceTimed her. I said, we're making Marry Me. She, what? She went to Toronto with Hustlers. She, she, had, she, she handpicked the songs while she was on tour. She handpicked each song for the album. She got Maluma to, to record. Um, we had put a placeholder in the script that said something about you know, Bastian writes a song about second chances, right? We just called it Segundo. He writes it. <laughs> so in these three months, we, we, we pick the soundtrack. She pre-records. She comes off of tour. She goes to Toronto, opens Hustlers, and begins Marry Me. And we finish it just before um, New Year's Eve on 2020. So, wow. It was an odyssey, right? But I guess it all happened as it was supposed to. And behind the creative force of Marry Me is a team of very talented women. What can you say of that extraordinary team led, of course, by Jennifer Lopez? Well, I would say women get shit done. <laughs> the, 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 it, this is greenlit by a woman. The head of Universal is a woman, Donna Langley. And she's the one who said, I'm going to make it. And, you know, I think that the overlap between Jennifer Lopez and myself and Kat Coiro is that we've all been told no. We've all been marginalized. We've all been, um, we've all felt the um, insidious sort of implications, even when you call it a rom-com, not you, but you know, it's a great movie. I don't think they called Sabrina a rom-com or Roman Holiday a rom-com. We don't call Jackass a dick flick. But we do, in some way, right, marginalize these films as if they're only for women. But really, what we're finding is men love them as, as well. Um, I think that I am very proud of the women behind that took the women that raised their muscle together and through sheer will and tenacity rolled this boulder up the hill and, 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 and got a yes. So when I hear, please say yes. I think about making this movie. There's a lot of your will and tenacity there. And it's a really interesting process that you were explaining. But what were the crucial elements of the story that you always wanted to keep in the final cut? I believed, you know, I've worked with superstars. I was an agent for many years. And I would often see the the, the side the, that that, that they showed people, but then the vulnerable side and how much it hurt when they would be criticized and how difficult it was that many of them didn't sign up for this life of, 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 of being chased by paparazzi. They wanted to be actors. The, the dark side of fame is difficult. And I wanted and I hoped that Jennifer could show it. It was difficult for her. You know, she has done a very good job hiding how much it could hurt when you're the national joke on national television. Um, and I think it was oddly challenging for her to let down that, that you know, defense mechanism and let people see the, hum the humanity, let people see what it was like to live like a panda in a zoo. That's her line. She added so many lines to this to give, um, to amplify what it was like or to crystallize it. And I, I, when we were going around town trying to sell this, um, people had said, well, it's just preposterous. This kind of thing would never happen. And what I'm most proud of in this movie are the performances by Jennifer and Owen. Here's a woman on stage who is humiliated, who knows that everybody in the audience is looking at her boyfriend cheating with her assistant who was gonna get married, what was she doing in Madison Square Garden getting married or Hammerstein Ballroom in front of 20 million people? 
whose life had become a circus and a joke, and she was living it in real time. So having a sort of breakdown on stage and seeing in the audience a guy who was trying to figure it out and recognizing the humanity in each other. Of everything in this movie, that's what I'm most proud of because the absurdity of the, of the plot rested on the reality of that moment. Speaking of that moment, Kat, uh, the main character, makes an impulsive decision to get married. Uh, what impulsive decisions would you say that you've made in your career as a filmmaker? Well, I was an agent. I was on the top, at the top of my game, the top of my game in 2000. And um, I was a writer who was frustrated because I, I was reading everybody else's material. And I think, you know, representing some of the biggest stars in the world, I said, okay, I'm done. And um, that was scary. A lot of people thought that I was, that it was a fool's, a fool's decision, but it can't be a fool's decision when it comes from your heart and your truth. And I think that's what this movie is about, discovering your truth and standing in your truth and trusting the romance of the universe, trusting the leap of faith. You know, Rumi said, walk on the way and the way appears, which is basically take the leap of faith. And you've managed to do it and make the movie, but you know, the world has been through some challenges in this last year and a half. How was it to finalize the film with, with all of that? Hard, so hard. We had, we're, we were, at, you know, I was used to sort of letting the director do their cut. Then I go in the edit for the, for the, um, you know, when, when, when they allow you in and get to, it was hard. Everybody was in different places. We had to shoot, we had to shoot, um, do an added scene. You know, there's a scene where Kat is um, getting a massage and Bastion's in, um, calls her and says how excited he is. Well, he was actually in Medellin, Colombia. Jennifer was in Miami. Kat was in LA. I was in New York. We, somebody was there to sort of hold a boom mic. We, we had to shoot it at the height of, of COVID. Um, hard. We, we never got to see it. We never got to see it in a room with people. They, they, did, it, they did tests in St. Louis and we zoomed into the focus group so we could see them laughing. We knew it played well. It tested through the roof, but we never got to sit in a room. And, and on Tuesday, we have a little screening, our very first screening, that we get to see this movie with a live audience. It was hard. But again, you can't question. It all happened for a reason, as it was supposed to, because I can't think of a better time for this movie to come out than right now. Right, Jose? I couldn't agree more. Uh, you mentioned before during our conversation that uh, two classic um, movies like um, William Wyler's um, Roman Holiday or, or Billy Wilder's uh, Sabrina, both, by the way, with Audrey Hepburn. Uh, but you've produced um, some wonderful romantic comedies also. Uh, they're asking, uh, in what way has the production process of approaching these movies changed over the years? Well, when I did Made in Manhattan, I think the budget, I could be wrong, but I think the budget was like $52 million and, you know, $50 million, 50 shooting days. It was a luxury to it. You know, it was 2002, maybe, I, I think, when I made it. Um, and, and, you know, we shot all around New York. Um, when I made Marry Me, it was, like I said, 23 million plus some branding money. Um, and it was about convincing people that we need these kind of movies. And, you know, the tracking on this movie is through the roof. Everybody seems to want to see it. Now, will they go to movies? I don't know. I don't know if our habits have changed, but I don't long, I no longer care. This movie is going to be around certainly all year. It's going to be streamed and then restreamed. And I certainly hope people go to the movies to see it. But either way, I couldn't be prouder of this film. And part of that is because what I had to go through to make it. <laughs> you know, Made in Manhattan, which also, by the way, much like, oddly, much like Marry Me, I haven't really thought about it. Made in Manhattan was a script called Chamber Made that John Hughes wrote. And it was very broad. Rest in peace, John Hughes. We, I read it and I said, wouldn't it be interesting to do a film about people who work in a city that they can't afford to live in? 
and give it more of a verite look and, you know, have it a maid with her, her, her nose pressed to the snow globe that is Manhattan. And Jennifer was staying at my house at the time. So we beat out, we did a beat sheet, she and I, about four pages long. We pitched it to John and to Joe Roth, who was the head of my company. And Joe loved it. John, not so much, <laughs> but Joe loved it and, um, and just loved everything about it and said, follow that through. So we both wrote an outline for Made in Manhattan and kind of willed it to be, while well, a Cinderella story about a, was about a maid, people go, God, she just played a maid that dances around. No, she played a maid who wanted to be a manager. She played a maid who didn't strive to be invisible. So even then it was about reaching. And what we did on Made in Manhattan, we did again on Marry Me. So there you go, 20 years later, crazy. I think you've achieved it and I think you're right. This is the movie that we need now and many people are gonna love it. Everybody's very excited. Congratulations, Elaine. Thank you, Jose, and thank you for your enthusiasm. It means the world to us. I hope <laughs> people you. go to the movies. All right, I'm sure thanks. they will. Bye-bye. Clear. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!